All right. We're back, man. The Crave Show. I'm excited. We've got a special guest this week. We've got Tex with us this week. Tex, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's really good to see you. Jay Russ, how's it been going? You have a good week? Good, yeah. It's um, it's crazy hot in Chicago right now. It's going to be hotter tomorrow. So um, uh, it's, we've got, we just had our last training day before, uh, well, I mean, basically before we go to Norway. And uh, it's kind of nice when you get done with the, the training schedule and you know you are what you are and we're just going to the comp. And, and uh, so just a little summer fest in between the, uh, us in a competition yeah man it's been hot down here too it seems like it's getting hotter and hotter every day i think next week we're supposed to have one day that's like 108 or something i don't know that's crazy I where are you it. at right now tex <laughs> i'm down in uh houston right now at that scott of spaceland houston oh we're, so it's we're super much, hot uh, oh yeah it's uh hot and humid and uh i love every second of it uh, <laughs> Weather's well, been consistent. I mean, I, I love it. I don't know. Something you, you get up, you go outside in the morning, you go for a run, and you're just drenched in sweat. And there's no like warming up into the day. It's just like Dude, you don't even have to go to here. a run to be drenched in sweat. You just walk outside and you're drenched in sweat out of Houston. That's it. So, so uh, <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. it. Makes me feel so healthy. I'm, uh, I'm a little crazy like that. Hey, <clears> where, where did you grow up, man? North Texas. North outside Texas. Of Dallas. Yeah. Okay outside of Dallas so you know this is what we were playing sports in this you know doing two a days and three a days and 110 degree heat so uh, to me this feels like a walk in the park and to go skydive especially here in Houston we go walk into an air-conditioned packing room you kidding me it's a country club skydiving <laughs> country. <laughs> yeah. oh man that's awesome yeah well <clears throat> for some of our listeners and and uh Tex, we're man, really glad that you're here with us this evening to, to record we're going to be talking about exit order but i want to just go over you know we've, we've said this on the other on the other episodes and i just want to say it again our whole goal with this show is to just um help everybody know more to to be better to be safer to have more knowledge you know um we've kind of got this this foundation of knowledge in the in the skydiving community or at least this is how i kind of visualize it you know Everybody has this base of knowledge, and it starts off in AFF when you learn all the stuff and, and as you go. But my, my hope and my goal with, with Crave and with the show and what we're trying to do is just raise that, that foundation of knowledge that everybody across the board has access to really good knowledge, really good information, good coaching, good instruction, um, that we truly can all do more and be better, that we can be safer, we can have more fun together, um, we can just build up the skydiving community. So that, that's what we're trying to do, you know, even with this show. And one of the things we've talked about in the past, I just want to say again, is um, if you're listening to the show, if you have if you have questions that you want to ask, you can <clears throat> please you can write us message us through Facebook, through Instagram, through the website. Um, get in contact with me or J Russ at the drop zone. If you see us uh, walking around, uh, we would love to hear those questions and, and we'll try to answer them if we don't know the answer. We'll find somebody that does, and we'll we'll figure out the right answer and share it with everybody, you know. Or if you have ideas for the show that you'd like us to to talk about and cover, that's why we're that's why we have text on tonight. Somebody asked us, "Hey, would you guys talk about exit order?" And um, so that's what we're doing, and and that's what we want to do. We want to be a blessing to the skydiving community and a benefit to everybody who's listening. So um, please, if you, if you have something, reach out to us, connect with us. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, cool. Let, let's get into it, man. Um, exit order. I, I think it'd be really great if we just start off with just kind of basic exit order. Why? What is the exit order? And why is it that way? Um, and is it is it always that way at every drop zone? Let, I mean, those are those are quite a few questions right there. But let, let's start off with that um, and kind of go from there. Sure. Tex, you want to start? Uh, yeah. I mean, we can just provide just a really basic uh, understanding of, of an exit order. I mean, we're using both the speed of the airplane and the group's uh, anticipated drift and fall rate to the advantage of, uh, sorry, someone just decided to start mowing the lawn, of course. Uh, <laughs> get started here. Um, 
we're, we're using those those two major factors as a way of creating separation between groups. So ultimately, that's that's what it is, is that we're trying to create as much separation uh, feasibly as possible to give everyone an equal opportunity of, of landing back on the drop zone. Um, having said that, there's some ways that are a little bit more advantageous than others, and that can vary depending on uh, the airplane. It can depend on the conditions, the type of groups on the plane. And in particular, where I put my uh, specialty recently is in, uh, I can't believe this, Wood Whacker. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, uh, it's been on the, the impact of, of movement groups because it's become such a popular discipline. Now we're having uh, not just one, but multiple movement groups uh, commonly on airplanes. And that has really made the exit order discussion, I feel like, uh, much, much more nuanced in modern skydiving uh, than we've uh, previously had to deal with. So exit orders become quite a contentious topic, as I'm sure both of y'all would uh, attest at your drop zones. There's a, quite a few differing opinions based on the day and who you're talking to and whether it's an old school belly guy or, or a new school, you know, angle flyer who hasn't put too much thought into it and thinks that he's supposed to go first every time because, uh, you know, they usually go first. And so it, be, it becomes more and more nuanced as you get into it. But again, to get down to the fundamental reason, uh, we're trying to use uh, ground speed of the aircraft and its anticipated uh, drift uh, of the groups to create as much separation between groups as possible, especially at, uh, at canopy height. Because we're valuing that horizontal separation over vertical separation in most cases. Okay, nice. That, that's, thank you. That's a very good good overview. Jairus, would you just, for the, for the moment, let's set aside movement jumps. Let's just let's set that to the side and not include that discipline for now and just go over what is a typical exit order on an airplane when you have mm -hmm. belly free fly uh whatever i mean whatever you can think of whatever you want to include it's just common typical load what's the exit order going to be and, and briefly discuss why why those are that order well I think the easiest thing to start with is just that big wave belly normally goes first, the belly in general, and, and works towards smallest group of belly flyers, and then the biggest free fly group would go next, working towards the smallest group. And then uh, you'd have maybe students or AFP, AFF, um, and tandems, and in the very back, uh, last to exit would be wing suits if we include them in the conversation. Um, <clears throat> or high, or high, pull, high pulls. Or high pulls, yeah. People who might okay. be pulling at an, an altitude significantly higher than whatever's considered normal for your drop zone. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's my understanding that uh, the that exit order is based on uh, drift for the most part. Um, and I think the thrust of the question that came to us it actually came from Joey, uh, who does jump here on, on one of the – uh, on an MFS team that's based here. Um, sorry, let me stay on topic. Uh, the drift potential is highest for belly flyers, uh, as I understand, other than, I guess, wingsuiters. But um, their presentation into the wind as they leave the plane means that they're going to get a lot of drag relative to the airplane because they're going to expose a lot of surface area. And so they're going to slow down a little bit quicker than other groups perhaps and the size also makes a difference as as you add more people um, you're pushing more air and then the belly flyers are also going to drift more in while they're in free fall they, they're traveling relatively slower um, so the prevailing winds are going to push them a little bit more than they will free flyers and so they can cover quite a bit of ground in in their drift compared to free flyers that present much less to the wind as they exit and so they kind of punch through the relative wind when they get out of the plane. Um, I don't know if that's the right terminology, but they're just not getting as much drag as the belly flyers. And so um, they're gonna, you know, all of us have that, that sort of parabolic pathway as we leave the plane, as we lose the forward throw of the airplane and start descending vertically. And um, belly flyers do that more quickly, I think. They, they slow down relative to the plane more quickly um, and then they're gonna drift longer. So, um, What's as oh sorry if I keep going back uh, the A AFP students after we get the smallest way free fly AFP students are probably going to pull higher 
their belly flyers so that's a little bit out of sequence with the free flyers but they're going to pull around five typically for a student and um so in spite of the fact that they might get drift we're counting on that vertical separation to keep us safe uh, that they're going to, even if they drifted towards us, they're going to pull so much higher that we're going to be descended down below them. Um, it obviously, hopefully, obviously brings up a potential problem if somebody who, say, there's a few students and they do get a lot of drift and they drift over the last free flyer and then they have a cutaway. That That is, a, that defeats that vertical separation. Um, but we're, at some point, you kind of got to hedge your bets and do the best we can with what we've got. Um, and then tandems would go after the students, again, pulling higher. Um, I, I don't, most drop zones probably pulling about five or five, five for like a normal tandem. And then uh, wing suitors are dead last um, because they have so much time in free fall. If, if a wing suitor gets out of the plane on a load that I'm on, I'm, I'm touching down. He hasn't even finished half of his can, but half of his, his, his uh, free fall time. Um, so they're just, they go dead last. Um, the, the discussion that Joey had that, that kind of related to, that brought up the subject was that he had a, a group say that they were, I think say they were belly flying, but they did a tube exit because they thought that'd be fun. Um, and Joey didn't realize that until everybody was in the plane. And so it just brought up a general conversation about what's the most important thing to consider is the first few seconds of the skydive when we really hit the wind uh, the most important thing about like where do you stack in the order if you're exiting free flying but then you're going to end up on your belly and, and sort of how does that you know as tech said it gets kind of nuanced and and as a, a further twist um, we were training today with an eight-way team at Scott of Chicago and the eight we usually go before the eight-way team because they have like a 20 second climb out um, they have a few canopies in their group that are sized more like maybe 135. I think the smallest canopy in their group is about a 79. And the biggest canopy in my group is 79. Um, and so if we go after them, which has happened before, we actually open before they do because we have a quick climb out and a really fast free fall. Uh, so we reverse the order, which is atypical for some drop zones and and in fact we had an old belly flyer at sky of chicago today his name's sky i think his d license number is in the the double digits uh he's 82 or three he's a really good flyer um but he said no no no. angle goes first and then the belly flyers and i didn't even argue and we just changed the order because it's it's not worth the argument um but we do regularly when with groups that we're comfortable with we'll we'll go first as the free fly group and then let them, if especially eight wakes, they're so long in the door um, that by the time the eight way group opened up after us, I'm watching them in free fall. They're still turning points as I'm pulling my slider off and I'm setting, I'm like starting my turn to final as their canopies are opening. Um, so we also, we feel like that's actually a better scenario than the, the typical exit order. So a lot of different possibilities. Yeah. Okay, I want to I want to ask, kind of talk about something, but then I want to go back to that question that you asked me ago. What's the, what do we consider, or what should we consider more, the first few seconds or where you're going to end up? I think that's a really interesting question. But um, first, that typical, kind of more traditional exit order that you just described, um, is that because um, jump run is typically into the wind. Hmm. Text, text. You're nodding. You, what, what? I mean, yeah. That... I mean, typically speaking, yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be into the wind. So it's gonna, in some shape or form, make the the drift that you anticipate those groups having as a little bit predictable. Um, that becomes more of an issue when you have wind shear sort of situations with different canopy winds and things like that, where that could negate that advantage uh, of flying into the wind. Um, but just hearing J. Russ's example of them going first before that belly group, for instance, just makes me want to point out uh, because I've said I've had similar discussions recently. Granted, it's been more geared towards the movement group's relationship towards static flyers, but even in that scenario he's describing there, he's still ensuring horizontal separation as the, the primary, you know, primary reason. Uh, the vertical separation of them being on faster canopies 
and basically already turning on the final by the time they're opening is almost the cherry on top. It's it's the bonus that they have that giant virtual separation because you can't really rely on that, especially let's right. be honest, belly flyers behind us. They, they like to pull low some of those guys, especially the old school guys. So we don't want to rely on that. But in that situation where it can pretty much be guaranteed that their climb out is going to take 20 plus seconds, things like that. It makes a lot of sense because it's going to it's going to guarantee the horizontal separation. So I just wanted to make and you, that and point. just just to clarify for people listening, you're saying because they're taking so long climbing out, the plane is continuing to move. That's providing that horizontal separation. It's, create, it's creating that yeah. separation for okay. them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then the vertical separation is, a, is the, the bonus on that. Gotcha. And any anything, any situation where someone's opening above four, five, or five, like the example J. Russ gave about the students and why we, we put them at the back as belly flyers is because that's one of the, the rare times that we we hedge our bets on that uh, that vertical separation happening because it's, you know, it should happen that way. And, and on the rare times it doesn't, a lot of times uh, we can negate that because they're going to take long climb outs as well as students. And things mm-hmm. like that. So, um, yeah, getting getting back to your, what was your uh, original question there, Chris? Uh, well, I thought that what Jay Russ brought up, you know, what do we consider more or what should we consider more that initial exit? Ah. Like with those guys doing a, the tube exit or a, more of a free fly exit, but then ending up belly, do we, what do we want to consider more? And, and what if people are doing like a hybrid jump and, you know, right. I, I, I don't know if there's ever going to be a good answer for that because I think it's going to depend on the situations as well, because there's going to be some days where the, the, the uppers are going to be very significant and we want to know, well, if they jump out in a, in a tube or some sort of free fly ish exit, and then are on their belly for the majority of the jump with really high upper winds, there's a very good chance they're going to drift over a, uh, a vertical group, for instance, that exited before them, versus another day where all things being equal, um, maybe it makes more sense to have uh, uh, them going, you know, before a slightly bigger group because it's going to help uh, ensure a little bit more vertical separation. Um it's really tough to say. I think the presentation on exit though is such a difficult one because the data that I've been seeing recently has shown more and more how important that is to our actual separation um, by the time we get to our, our canopy height. And that's something that really was not discussed up until the last few years, as I know it, um, trying to figure out exit order considerations. It was always issues with ground speed and uh, the upper winds that day and things like that. And now we're hearing so much that the presentation on exit is a, is a large, large factor, much bigger than we even, uh, uh, I would have felt like was exaggerated years ago, but now I'm seeing data that uh, the impact on our forward throw is pretty massive. How do you take that into account though? You know, like- Yeah, hold, well, hold, hold on, Un- unpack, unpack that a little bit, Tex. What data are you talking about like from FlySight and stuff? Or what do you mean? What data? I, well, so, I mean, this may be a good, have been Juan here because he's going to know a lot more about this, but I've heard uh, from him and, uh, and a few other people that they've been, they've been studying it. I've seen, gosh, I can't tell you exactly where I've seen it. So let me, uh, let me make sure that I'm, uh, you know, I can cite these sort of things, but I know Benoit was a huge, huge, uh, Benoit LeMay, this, uh, huge into examining the impact of forward throw, um, on our presentation on exit. And he provided me, with some just uh, like astounding kind of examples um, of what uh, of what they think may be happening, depending on how we're exiting the airplane, um, and has a much bigger impact on our actual separation than even ground speed in most cases. Um, which, in my experience, now that I've kind of had that in my the back of my head over the past few years and I've paid attention to it, I've certainly noticed that to be true in my anecdotal world. So. Um, now, how we how we make that into a policy for a drop zone um, is very difficult, but it's definitely a consideration that I think we have to take in, such as an eight-way team who may be really badass and they may actually truly leave as eight versus a, you know, they may get such a big presentation to the win versus another group that exits eight people, but it's a scattered eight people and it's not going to have nearly the... Uh, the same sort of drift because of their presentation on exit. Okay, so can you un- unpack or, or maybe 
how has your like that that information and that a little bit newer understanding that you've received from that data and from Ben can you give me an example of how your understanding or the way you think about exit order has changed whether it's a specific change in exit order or just something how you've learned something new and different what what's kind of changed for you know I'm, I'm just trying to I, under, I, I want to understand better sure i suppose just a like a just an obvious example would be if there's an eight-way team practicing that's a real eight-way team and an eight people going on a hybrid or a belly jump or something like that i can assume that that eight-way team is going to have a much larger presentation to the win because and how, how will that be how will that be different they're, than they're the... gonna they're going to drift more. So I'm going to want them okay. to go before a group that's going to be a zoo dive of eight people jumping out in an okay. exit order, for instance. And then it's the same consideration that, where my mind usually goes because I'm, I'm typically leading uh, angle jumps is where my mind goes is where I can anticipate these people to end up on jump run relative to where I want to uh, fly to and, and open up as well. So an eight-way team that's, that's exiting is going to have a much larger and maybe in my mind more predictable drift than that that seven that eight way tube jump that's going out right after them that's going to the belly and then trying to build a hybrid or something like that my for me it's it's where i'm gonna anticipate being off a jump run it's gonna be much farther relative to those people because of how little i can anticipate their their actual drift so to me the presentation makes a lot a big difference on the predictability of where these people are going to end up based on the conditions as I know them that day. Okay, that that makes sense. That's very helpful. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, yeah. so go go ahead, Jairus. Were you going to say something? No, not really. It was a great explanation. Uh, no, good. Okay, so so now can we talk a little bit about the movement jumps and how does that how does that affect things? What do we need to be considering? What do we need to be thinking about? One, th one thing you just said, uh, Tex, that is really helpful for me, and it's going to take me some time to really sit and think through, is really trying to anticipate and take into consideration what those people are doing on the jump and where they will end up. Like, that, that for some reason, that's really helpful to me. Where are they going to end up? Trying to anticipate for everybody on the plane, when they pitch their can their pilot shoot where will they be and let's try to help everybody be as far apart from one another as possible yeah yeah so it, it comes what what can come out of that for me is uh if i cannot anticipate very well where I, where these people are going to end up i have to now increase my margin of error by opening up where i'm willing to uh to open or take my my angle group to so if it's an eight-way group, I feel pretty confident I, with certain conditions that I'm going to have a good good grasp over where I'm going to see these people uh, opening versus <laughs> another that, type of jump. Is that, is that a weed eater? <laughs> what is that thing? Right there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, it's an it's actual, like he's, he's, well, he's, doing a, he's using a leaf blower, but he's got a pool in his backyard, and that's about it. So I'm not I, thought sure. he was, I thought he was weed eating around your feet, man. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, swear, I swear he's like blowing the leaf the leaf blower into his pool right now. That's awesome. So, and no, it's not it's not that bad. We we can hear it, but it's not that bad. Go uh, ahead, man. Sorry. sorry. The, what are the what are the odds? Sorry, man. Um, so yeah, just just predictability wise, that tells me a lot about where I want to go and don't want to go. Maybe even days where I don't want to be sharing a side with anyone else because I want to make sure that I have a little bit more leeway if I'm going to one side or the other. And there's a eight-way zoo dive going on uh, on that jump uh, as well as I, I think this is a great time to bring up the, the question which is you know, most modern drop zones have adopted for exit order the policy of having angle groups going first in most situations if they're smart they leave a lot of room open for for those conversations to take place um, but in a lot of places I've been to, it's just more or less, it's easier to make it a hard rule. So it's become a hard rule at a lot of places that angle groups go first. So I just want to put it out to, to the audience of like, you know, if they know, or if y'all want to answer, um, why, why has that become the norm in most places? And what, what is that, uh, why is that an interesting place to start this new exit order conversation in terms of adding in the movement groups? 
Okay, so wait, so, you're, so what is your question? Why, 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 why do angle groups go first? I was about to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those places. I mean, I'm happy to answer it. No, 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 no. Let, it, let us think. J, I'm sure J. Russ knows. I, well, it's I, knowing, I'm knowing is it. different than having, I mean, <laughs> I might think I know, <laughs> but uh, I don't, text does this for a living and I don't. Um, so I would say, I mean, in general terms, the reason that m most of the time we put out an angle group first is because if you think about the the, the line of, of how we're going to drop jumpers on whatever, just if we probably the easiest to, to envision is just a, a northbound jump run. Um, and whatever your green light is, wherever that is relative to the center of the drop zone or however they calculate it, the group that gets out first as an experienced angle group, if you, it looks like kind of an upside down umbrella. If you draw a line going just straight up your paper and then you draw a half circle under that line, the, the group that gets out first can turn back behind the green light. And so their play area is totally uninhibited because there's nobody there and there's nobody gonna be there. And so they get a very big 180 degree path uh, area where they can they can turn, they can move, they can turn back. As long as they don't make it beyond the point of the green light, they have totally free airspace. Um, and I don't know if a lot of people consider that, but but for especially for leaders who wanna do orientation changes, they wanna do pitch changes, they wanna, they wanna have a, a, an active skydive, that 180 is incredibly valuable as, as a, I, as long as I don't make it back to the green light point, I shouldn't encounter anybody. Yeah, absolutely. That's super well said. Um, I haven't heard that umbrella example, but I like it. That's a, that's a, that's a good way of visualizing. That's nice. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in basic terms, it's that it, it opens up a quadrant in the sky behind the, the exit point that no other group can really get to. No other static group can get to. So you have a entire airspace to yourself that is, you know, pretty, pretty darn safe that can get canceled out in some conditions. So the reason I brought that up was this is why the exit order discussion is, I think, so important in our, you know, current skydiving world where angle flying is so popular because it's it's now it's no longer really considered deeply as to what the order should be. It's just angle flyers want to go first. Um, a lot of times they want to land first and it doesn't match the actual conditions of that day, which a lot of times negates that advantage of going first because there are times where as we all know, uh, being the first out of the airplane is not advantageous to, you know, making it back very easily or flying a full pattern or dealing with the canopy traffic that is coming from, uh, you know, better, uh, better position. So it can be negated very easily. And so I just want to make sure that when we're talking about this exit order discussion uh, as related to any sort of angle flying, that people make sure that they're, they're analyzing whether or not they should be going first or, or would even want to go first in a lot of uh, cases, such as J. Russ mentioned jumps with a lot of orientation changes and things like that. A lot of times that means you're not going off the line of flight for, as far. And for me, if I'm doing a lot of layouts and then a carve and then we move again and then another thing and then we move again, well, we're not actually moving off a jump run that far. So my actual line, if you were looking down at me flying, may just be pretty much perpendicular 90 degrees off jump run which is not going to put me very far off jump run, which in some cases with, uh, you know, heavier winds means that I'm going to be crazy short of the drop zone. And that's not somewhere I want to be. So I'm going to go later in the order if I can. And I'm going to use the conditions for not just my safety, but the, the safety of the entire load as well. Yeah, I, I, I think it's really important to, to have, um, I mean, wherever text jumps, they're going to have a, a, a good amount of education but that's, you know, like he can explain all of this nuance to anybody that cares to listen. Um, but somebody in somebody in the audience, Kevin, just asked, how do we educate other flyers who don't understand the reasons we would leave in different spots? And it, I agree that it's not always first. And in the case that that Tex just talked about, like, hey, the wind, the wind condition isn't great for what I would like to do. And so in the example that I gave before about um, us leaving before eight way, we actually, depending on what the angle flyers want to do, if, if they think a lot of times the drop zone will put us out 
as a sponsor team, they'll put us out in a spot they're really not sure about. And for sure, they wouldn't put other people out there. But they have confidence that we're decent canopy flyers and we can get back to where we need to be. And so the angle group might actually go second. And that puts more horizontal separation between a vertical group and whatever the flat group is that's coming after us. It builds in more safety. It puts the angle group in a better wind position. So most of the time when I make it to the boarding area, we've got a local couple, Dan, um, Dan Adams and Leslie Minetrier, who um, do have done a lot of angle camps and are leading those camps themselves. And I just, hey, what do you guys want to do? Because uh, it, it isn't super critical for us. Um, I know they're going to get off line of flight. They're, they're very experienced. I know I'm not going to encounter them. So it's not like every jump I need to be considering. Are we going to be safe on this jump? Do you know what you're doing? Do you know the pathway you're going to take? Go ahead and tell it to me. And none of that kind of stuff. I can take for granted that it's going to be right. And then an, act, an angle group in between free fall groups actually can be safer. It, it builds in more separation when they're going to track away from line of flight the whole time anyway. So um, I, I, I understand why drop zones the same way. It's just the easiest thing to say, okay, th this is the rule and everybody has to do it, but it doesn't always work best. And, but I, I mean, I get that sometimes the um, path of least resistance for a DZO or a manager can, can be enticing. But I, I, as to Kevin's question on here, how do we educate everybody other than doing what we're doing? I don't, I'm not really sure. Um, but, uh, Hopefully, there is a, a pathway out there where DZOs and DZ managers can can talk to somebody who's got experience with this so that it doesn't have to necessarily be a hard and fast rule, but can be whatever is the safest thing at that time. I, I just want to point out that's that's a great way of putting it, Jairo. I mean, that's we're, we're doing what we're doing right now in terms of the, the education side of it. Uh, the reason I, I wanted to make that point about uh, angle groups really need to consider a lot of different variables before they just decide, oh, they should go first. Because yes, in a lot of cases, it does open up that airspace and that may be uh, advantageous for them or for the entire load, but there's gonna be plenty of conditions as well where that doesn't make the most sense, not only for them, but for the entire load. And the privilege is on the movement flyers and the angle flyers, because they're the ones moving off of the line of flight. They're the ones who are ultimately get to choose where they're going to open off the line of flight. So it is up to them to really think these things through. Like J Russ said, you're going to get off the line of flight. You're going to go behind me. Great. You know, because angle flyers should be able to go anywhere in the exit order, which makes this conversation even more confusing because we can't ever come to a, a consensus because it's going to be different all the time based on what they're doing on the jump, the conditions, the size of their group, the, what else is on the airplane. Um, so it's ultimately the education side. I feel like we need to hit and hammer um, the people uh, leading those jumps, especially uh, because they have such an important role in making the jump safer, not just for their own group, but for everyone on the load. And so it's them that has to we have to focus that education on because um, yeah. uh, it, it, at the end of the day, a successful movement jump is getting off the line of flight and respecting other groups airspace and making it back to the drop zone. So you should be able to go ostensibly anywhere in the order to do that. However, there's gonna be a lot of different ways to play with that that makes it safer for you and for everyone else in the load too. Hmm. Yeah, so um, related to, to what Tex is saying here, there's a there's a guy that's out at Summerfest right now, Boo, I, I can't remember his real, uh, still don't put me on angles. I, I can't remember his real name, but most people know him as Boo. Um, He's out here to organize for Summerfest uh, here a few days early. And he's, his comment in the chat here says something to help me better understand angles was taking an angle workshop with Tex, Sharon, and Pr Prunetto. That's Luis Prunetto. Um, instead of following the LO during an angle, by taking the workshop, it helped me understand how and why the LO is designing the jump. And so related to that, and, and I'm, I, I'm guessing that, uh, Texas had to do something similar, but at Scottish Chicago, we do have people who can lead and, and are competent to lead, and, and we have a lot of experience with them. Um, but we have people come all the time who would like to lead, but we don't know that person. And so one of the things that's had had to change a little bit was um, was that we had to have some kind of certification process for the people that we don't know um, to at least educate them about the, the specifics of Scottish Chicago that can influence uh, the way that they go um, the exit order they can take, the, the directions they can go, the outs, the, 
just all the sort of logistical issues that go along with being a leader. And one of them um, that I want to point out is that I mentioned a little uh, upside down umbrella shape with a half moon at the beginning of jump run. And for a long time, and it's I think for a lot of drop zones, it's still the case that if there's a second movement group, they would go last for the exact same reason that it, now it's an, a right side up umbrella, but the 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 last 180 degrees now past where the last group got out is their play area. And so if there were two, two angle groups that wanted, you know, a big play area first and last made sense, but it's got Chicago. It doesn't make sense um, because a lot of our jumps have what's called a hook. And instead of, um, instead of doing a full 360 uh, to bring people back around to the original jump, like if we get too far away from the drops on and we need to, we can't keep dropping people because it's too far away. We'll do a hook. And so the, the pilot will just hook back around and go the opposite direction. And anybody who's been on angles, I think, or at least anybody who leads angles competently will understand that that's a very challenging situation um, to put yourself into. And so we don't let, we don't have the, the second angle group go last. We have them go first and second as a prescribed but not required uh, slots. Um, and the first group would turn into the hook and the second group would turn away from the hook. So at, at different drop zones, there can be a lot of nuance again, that needs to be considered. And it, it, um, but it's very helpful. It's, it's just super helpful. It, I mean, it would be really nice in my opinion, if every drop zone required someone at their DZ to go to a camp that Tex or Luis or Sharon puts on, and learn this leadership stuff and then, and okay, now you can come back and maybe they can certify other leaders or something like that. But it's really, it is really challenging to, to just let anybody lead these, uh, these jumps because there's so much that goes into them and, and so much that's required as far as the leader knowledge to keep everybody safe. That it's, it is, it's a challenge for drop zones. And Boo, yeah, I won't I, put I you on just... any angles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, hello, Boo. Um, <laughs> if I could just uh, just take that uh, one step farther, I mean, I think you said it really well. And one of the most unique aspects of this style of flying, this discipline, is the massive responsibility on these jump leaders. And this is something that is, frankly, it's uh, it's still evolving. Uh, every year, our understanding of it, our ways to um, uh, standardize it, our ways to try and make it as as easily digestible for for people at different drop zones with different conditions and and uh, situations. But there is just a massive responsibility on the shoulders of the people leading these jumps, and it's simply just never going to be as easy as coming up with a hard and fast rule for for these sort of movement jumps. So as a community, I think it's really good that we're having these conversations because it, it really shows me um, that people are starting to come to terms with that in a sense. Uh, this is not going to be like uh, like some of the static disciplines where in most situations, in most conditions, it's uh, there's only a few variables that we need to take into account for the exit order, for instance. Um, these particular styles of jumps is so much dependent on the competency and experience and awareness levels and decision-making skills of these particular leaders. And it's very hard to create policies that will just make it all okay for you know any particular person to take on that responsibility. So as a community, I think we need to be well doing what we're doing here and making sure that uh, people understand the massive responsibility of leading these jumps and some of the things that that entails uh, of having to check off. So for instance, uh, Jay Russ was discussing, not just anyone can lead at Skydive Chicago. And I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more and I'm not a, not a huge rules guy, uh, but having said that, I think rules exist to eliminate the most egregious of offenders. So I think rules and policies should absolutely exist um, and but that alone does not make us as a safer community um, because someone can have, you know, a certain experience level on paper and then still make really terrible decisions uh, in the planning stage of their skydive and the, also the execution. So there's more to it, but the rules should exist to eliminate those most egregious of errors. So for instance, the person with 50 jumps going and leading a, 
a track and jump for their buddies. Um, the tunnel guy with 100 jumps who's trying to do all the layouts and carving and calling it a movement jump, and there's just no way he has that sort of awareness that he's doing all that and navigating at the same time. These are, these are things that at Spaceland, we've developed some really basic rules for tracking and angle flying, both as a participant and a leader. And they involve early on jump numbers, but I feel like to a certain point, once you get past that 200 jump number, it's, it's very hard to start eliminating people from their ability to do this without, like Jay Russ said, some sort of checkout something. So we've, we've begun developing uh, approved leader list down here in Texas, which is, uh, it's a pretty simple um, uh, upfront way of just like creating a slight little barrier to leading jumps of just showing some level of, of competency or some level of receiving training or mentorship in this style of jump before you start to participate. And then when you start to participate either, you know, uh, especially as a leader that you do this with a big understanding that uh, a lot of accountability comes with uh, the jumps that you do. So, uh, you know, if you're making mistakes, um, you're going to be under the spotlight. Um, if you're, if you're not trying to receive more ongoing training on these sort of things, or you're, you know, you're checked off on the approved leader list and then you immediately jump to trying to do eight and 10 ways, you know, then it shows a little bit of that decision-making skill. So it just provides a, enough of a, of a little hurdle, um, to encourage people to seek out that, that extra training rather than just try and go out there and figure it out on their own as they go, which I think we've reached a point, particularly in this discipline, where that's that's simply not gonna, that's not gonna work. And again, what makes this discipline unique is the impact it has on other groups, because you can't just go do a zoo dive on an angle jump. You're going to not just affect the people in your group, but potentially other people that have done nothing wrong and are flying straight down. So that's, uh, that is why in this case, I think that certain rules and policies should exist and then if you if you don't mind me keep going for just a second this sort of uh education uh for the drop zones is something that i'm directly involved in at the moment so uh beyond just the, the teaching the leading workshop which is geared towards the flyers themselves i'm spending a lot of time uh, uh meeting with drop zones having these same sort of discussions and looking at what specific unique characteristics about their drop zone makes angle flying either easier or harder or what sort of particular difficulties they have so for instance the scout of chicago example is like the classic example in our uh, uh our style of flying with the curved jump runs for instance you know this uh, he mentioned first and last it just doesn't make sense there at scout of chicago um uh and then uh you know first and last in most cases is being used anyways for groups that are sharing the same side so for some drop zones, that may not even be a be an option because maybe you can't track to a certain side. So, um, yeah, I think the the education has to be focused on uh, the flyers themselves, but particularly the jump leaders. So there has to be barriers to leading these sort of jumps that encourage people to seek out a higher level of training. And then for drop zones, we we certainly need some real general education uh, kickstart um, at most yeah. places, even big big drop zones even the big ones. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that, that, that there's a, at least a thought process about maybe something that could be delivered to DZOs or to DZOs could have access to and say, these are some things that you should be thinking about related to movement jumps at your DZ. Um, just because there is such an incredible variety of scenarios that go with those DZs, but if they have some sort of template to look at, um, and I, uh, Tex, I think you were a part of, I had a podcast with Melissa Nelson um, last week, not, not this one, but a different podcast. And she pointed out that in the sim now, there's a section related to angle flying. Um, and it's very basic information, but I think it's at least a good start of, of an accessible source of, of just guidance for, for people that don't have the education, maybe don't have the time to get it. I mean, I, I don't know what DZO is, is learning to angle fly right now, but it, it would be a small percentage of DZOs in my opinion. Um, but you know, if they could look online and say, okay, well, this is what they do in Spaceland and this is what they do in Chicago and this is what they do in Z Hills or whatever. And, and, um, you know, find something, some, conglomeration of those tidbits that might fit for their DZ and just, just, um, 
yeah, raise the educational level of the people who are who are supporting these jumps. Um, it'd be great. Yeah, we speaking of the sim when we we developed that it was a it was a sit down with a, a handful of us and we wrote it in a way you know when i read it it's uh i think it's really good uh i'm happy with uh with how it ended up but at the same time there's so much to it that i, I always <laughs> read it and i go oh god i could have you know i wish we could have just kept that that whole paragraph going and going and going but uh you know ultimately what we were trying to get across was just some really really basic uh ideas such as like flatter is safer you know flatter angles is is safer the size of the group smaller is better for these type of jumps you know bigger jumps are extremely advanced uh, anything with any sort of orientation changes are you know much much more advanced and uh again just starting to provide some some basic level of understanding that this is uh this is very difficult to to pull off um, and that the jump leaders themselves should also be, you know, have received coaching and continual training and these sort of things. And that was about as much as we could really truly get across in the sim. Yeah. Because even when, I, even when I read it now, I'm like, golly, that is that exactly how I want, would want it to say, you know? Um, but as far as educating the drop zones, um, you know, shameless plug, but that's actually, you know, what I'm, what I'm working on right now. So that is, uh, that is uh, what I'm doing at the moment. I have a few uh, big drop zones that I've, uh, I've started working with and we're just analyzing uh, specifics of their drop zone and ways that we can make it safer. And sometimes it comes down to everything from the, you know, the shape of the landing area and the, the offset that they typically use at that, that drop zone to things like what is how do we build a more informed culture at their drop zone maybe they have the means and they have the the, the experienced people there but they haven't quite figured out how to create assets out of these uh these both fun jumpers or sponsored jumpers and and things like that um so it's a it's a very big picture uh in terms of creating something that is anywhere close to gonna work ubiquitous you know uh, it's it's going to be very difficult to find that. So we have to get into how do we create this informed culture from not just the jumpers themselves, but the drop zones as well. And again, I think that the drop zone policies and rules should pretty much exist to just eliminate the most egregious of offenders. And beyond that, it really is going to come down to how much general education we can get out there into the community so that these sort of conversations are happening these higher level conversations about exit order even, uh, much less uh, um, how to lead these sort of jumps are taking place on a more regular basis. And uh, it's not being accepted that we can just kind of figure this out by, by just trying it out and trying stuff that we see on the internet, which is just getting more and more, getting more and more advanced every, uh, every day. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's a shameless plug, actually. I don't think, I don't think that effort could come quickly enough, to be honest, because I think that, in the past, I mean, to be honest, 20 years ago, uh, we were angle flying, and uh, uh, but it didn't. It just wasn't as popular. Like we went and did it, and we do it for a jump, and um, at the time we called it flocking, and there were other names for it, and there was kind of a funny uh, sequence of names that came out for it, and I think there was even a Wikipedia page dedicated to the to the naming. <laughs> Uh, hilarity, but um, there w there wasn't a need for as much as we have now because the as it wasn't really a discipline as a thing. It was just sort of we went and did it for fun. And and to his credit, uh, Luis and a few other people, Tex as well, have, have made it into a discipline of its own. And it's it's super fun. But now the the popular nature of it and so many people wanting to do it, um, it it like the the information that you're talking about as far as presenting drop zone owners or drop zone managers with a, at least some kind of template so they can they can make a safe environment that that can't come quickly enough so uh, i'm super excited to hear that's coming and I, I think on a previous podcast i i said that um spaceland z hills sebastian sky of arizona those places have contacted me just because they heard that i made a test for leadership and and had a you know a checkout checkout um uh, awesome. procedure for for um for new leaders and and they were you know those are some big drop zones that are asking for that kind of stuff um 
uh, hey, what are you guys doing? So we can kind of get a handle on what's going on at our place. And so if there's something that even acknowledging that there's so much nuance, there's so many variables that can go into what we're doing, just a, a template, some guidelines, um, that, that, that sounds really good. I, I just want to give you props real quick, J Russ, because, uh, I've, I've, wor I work really closely with, uh, with space in particular on these, these sort of, uh, issues. And, uh, yeah, you know, I've been really aware of the work you've, you've done in Chicago with, uh, you know, your, your approved leader list and the questionnaire and, and things like that, because we, we want as much information to see what everybody else is doing out there as possible. And, you know, I was really impressed when I, I think I got to take a look at Chicago's little checkout list. And what I really liked about those questions were, um, how specific it was to that drop zone, because that, that also tells me a lot as well, uh, because it's beyond some of them were just general education things. And then some of them were very much like specifics about that drop zone, uh, either drop zone policies and rules or things that a, an angle leader would want to know more of. Um, and if they didn't have those answers, it would really shine through that they, they didn't seek it out very much because if I don't know about this sort of this terrain issue on this side, but I'm willing to track that direction, I'm already a, a bad leader. Um, so, so some of the questions were, I felt like really spot on when I got to check that out. So I, I think it just goes to show for me, J Russ, like you as a, a, a VFS guy, of course, who certainly knows hmm. about Spangles, no doubt, but it just goes to show, and this is what I'm trying to get across to these drop zones that I've started working with, uh, for these, these safety policies and, um, and procedures is that you don't need to be the resident expert in movement flying and angle flying to make your drop zone safer. You just need to know what questions to ask. You need to know how to keep people accountable and you know you need to know some basic questions to ask, you know, the leaders themselves and information to provide people that they need to have and that they absolutely cannot get on a plane or make a jump plan without having that information. And even if you got to shove it in their face all the time, uh, through information boards and, and, and barriers to doing those sort of jumps, it's going to be worth it because in the end, like you said, the, the education is just not keeping up with the popularity of the discipline. So we, we've got to address it as, as soon as possible. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if this, if this is a good question or if you guys can do this, but are there, are there some, if you could just sit down with like all the angle LOs around the nation. If you just had all of our, everybody's ear for five or 10 minutes or however long, like what are the, are there some basic things that you would just like, you guys please think about this or what are the, the mistakes that, that were, that are being made? Like if you came and watched me leading groups at San Marcos, what would you, what are the mistakes you would expect to see me making and things that you're like, Chris, please think about this, please pay attention. Like, you know, is there some basic things that like a, almost like a 10 commandments, but it doesn't have to be 10. You know what I'm saying? Is that something you can, man, I would want to circle back to what tech said, because I, we had a leadership class the other day and this, this is uh, sort of ringing true in my mind, something that he said, and which is why I want to talk about it again. Cause the one commandment, if I had one, there's so many things about angle flying that leaders need to know, but in, in the angle workshop that just happened, which was a leadership workshop at Scott of Chicago that Dan, Dan and Leslie were running, um, I heard Dan talking about the responsibility that Tex mentioned. And so I stopped the class just for a second. I was like, look, you guys, I, I don't, I know that you guys are all newer jumpers. This is a really exciting discipline. You're going to have a really good time, but I want you guys to think very carefully about taking responsibility for other people's lives, because that's what you're doing when you're leading these jumps. And, and I don't know that a lot of people think about it in those terms, but if I, on more than any other jump, anything that happens at the drop zone, you are taking responsibility for the safety of other people because they're looking at you to lead them in the right direction and keep them safe. And they're not looking at anything else. They're just looking at you. Um, and so if, if there was a 10 commandments list, that would be number one for me to, for you to fully understand that th this is fun, but there's also a very real, um, there's some really real consequences to this being done wrong. And, and I'm sure Tex has seen that more than I have, but we've had our share of that here and some very, very close calls um, that, uh, that have definitely impressed upon me that um, people need to understand that fully. Hey, I, I just want to give you a standing ovation over here, J. Russ. <laughs> that's, uh, 
I mean, you could not have said that better. And, and the list of responsibilities is my favorite part of the leading workshop. So for the audience that hasn't taken the workshop, um, one of the first things that I do in the course is we sit down and we start to just, just spitball like the, the list of responsibilities that, that a leader has. And so it starts with all the predictable stuff of they come up with the jump plan. They pick the people on the jump. They check out the conditions that day um, and, you know, very typical stuff. And we get into it. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, we could spend 15 minutes, a half hour on this. And I can fill a chalkboard that is 20 feet wide, full of uh, full of responsibilities. And it's, it's that single thing that finally, I think, for a lot of people for the first time, makes it so tangible of how much responsibility and accountability that they really have on every single skydive because you're right these people will follow you into a volcano (laughs) yet when that door comes open it could be you could be flying right over a volcano and if you give that thumbs up your whole group is climbing out and they're going to follow you right into that thing Um, it is a it is a massive responsibility and to feel responsible for whatever happens on your jump is pretty unique to this discipline because if i'm flying a uh you know in a a uh, big sequential jump and somebody runs into somebody else, it's between those, those two people. It's not on the, it's not on the organizer. I'm not going to be mad at Rook that some guy overfloated on the record or something, you know, it's, it's on that jumper to, to, to fly that. Best. On my skydives, that's on me. It's on me. Could I have done that turn slower? Could I have taken that, th- that move out of the jump? Could I have done this? Those are the responsibilities of the leader. So beyond that, my other commandments would be, um, Big belly groups should go first. Um, this is seeming very obvious to me, and it's good with the exit order discussion tonight, but big belly groups should generally go first because that negates that open airspace behind the exit point because they're going to drift so far, especially in windy condition days. Um, You're saying that big then, belly uh, group is going to drift into that that upside yes. down umbrella. That They're going to drift past correct, the green light. Correct, especially if the, the winds are anything besides nominal. So, I mean... That, that gets, uh, again, a nuanced conversation because a, a six-way on a day where there's not so much wind and it's a fast jump run maybe doesn't fall into that category. But a six-way on a high wind day, I think, would definitely fall into that category. They're going to drift very far into that uh, that quadrant, and it's not going to make much sense to, to go before them. Um, so there's that. Uh, breaking off away from jump run is a one I see all the time when I'm uh, analyzing uh other people's jumps so breaking off away from jump run and breaking off away from the wall so that would be the invisible separation between uh other movement groups so if you're sharing a side with another movement group not breaking off in the direction of that group you'd be shocked how many this how many close calls this would save by just not breaking off in that direction um then my next one would be multiple groups is extremely difficult and we are now taking it for granted because the, pop, uh, the popularity of the discipline, we are taking it for granted that having multiple moving groups on an airplane is just commonplace these days. And while I love angle flying, and I'm stoked to see that when I go to drop zones around the world that some places it's the predominant flying discipline, it, we should not be taking for granted how difficult it is to share a side with another leader and how much trust that takes and how much that's dependent on the conditions and the type of group you have. and all these little things so we cannot take that for granted um never cross over the line of flight so if you're doing 270s out the door and things like that please please stop um please think twice about that um and then uh yeah i think the uh the last one i would have uh would just be um just always assuming that if your jump ends at this moment right now is your group going to be safe so especially as you get into more advanced skydives where you're doing lots of flock and rolls and head up and doing layouts and things like that, if this jump ends at any moment, is your group going to be okay? Because there's going to be plenty of times where something happens in the middle of that jump where you are you don't get to finish that last layout. And if everybody's safety on that skydive is dependent on that last little move you're going to do, that's probably not the right plan or you're probably not flying it in the right way. That's what I would share with uh, with a group of angle coaches if I could get them all on the phone. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Hmm. 
That's man, that's a really good. There's so much more to talk about. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the exit order conversation is a really good one because it opens up the door for I, I feel like a lot of these conversations. Man, you're it's not also kidding. it's also so so funny how contentious exit order has become. <laughs> Um, and I, I, I see it from the, the angle flyer side of it a lot because we're challenging the, you know, what was considered to be common knowledge, uh, not too long ago, we're, we're constantly challenging that, but I'm also, you know, I'm also out there really trying to promote this idea that it's the angle flyers that have the privilege because they're the ones that get to move off of the line of flight. So it is really up to the, the movement flyers to have a higher level of thinking about exit order. Um, so if you're at a drop zone and you're, there's a big, you know, uh, tension between belly groups and angle flyers and things like that, that seems like this just part of the natural, you know, ecosystem of a drop zone. I'm telling you that it, it shouldn't be like that. It should not be like that because the, the belly flyers should feel like the decisions we're making on exit order or the decisions they're making on exit order is safer for everybody. And that, uh, you know, we're not stuck into a box of, of just relying on a, a certain template to always make us safe um, because it will let us down sometimes. You know, the conditions will change. Um, the leader will make poor decisions. And there's things where exit order can create a larger margin of error um, for everyone on the load to be safer. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, f I feel like. Oh, sorry, Chris. Go ahead. Did you have no, to talk much? No, no, no. Go ahead. You, you guys are sharing so much good stuff. I'm just trying well, to soak it all up, man. I was just going to add to what Tech said that, like, what the contention that can can happen, like in the loading area. You're on the five minute call, and hey, let's figure out what exit order is going to be. I f I feel like a lot of that that I experience related to angle groups is is that the the people that are contentious about it don't know what. They don't know angle flying. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know. They don't know anything about it, other than they've they've tracked themselves, uh, probably after most skydives, and that's all that they know. Uh, and so, um, in, in a way, that guy's question a little bit earlier in the chat: What can we do about educating people? I mean, whatever it is, we, we need to keep doing it because I think that would relieve a lot of that tension. And more than that, the tension I'm, I'm maybe not as concerned about, but just people's peace of mind. Like most people, they just want to go out and have a safe skydive. But that unknown element of angle flying makes them, uh, I, don't, I don't know where I want you to go. Like I heard you're supposed to go first. Can you just go first? Um, because that makes them feel the safest, you know, and, and they also deserve to have a safe skydive. Um, but if we can, if if, if there's a way, if, if anybody in the community, and if this is text, that's great because I'm busy trying to get uh, worthless pieces of gold colored metal. Um, <laughs> that if somebody else can do it, that's great. Um, that's and, awesome. and, and spread that education around uh, so that people don't have to feel nervous about it. And they, they, un they really do understand at least the basics of it. So if their leader gets there, um, if their leader gets there and says, hey, we think this is going to be the best thing that they can say, OK, and, and it's not a contentious moment. It's like, oh, cool, that guy's trying to keep me safe. And, and I'm just going to say, OK, because I, I believe in this person. And, and I think that that's what's going to happen. I'm going to be safer because they do what they say they're going to do. Yeah, I, I hear you, you guys saying quite a few things that I, I think it's important. I want to try to put together a couple of things. Number one. A lot of leaders out there, myself included, don't realize what we don't know. Or, and we've, we've talked about this, Jerry. It's like, it's, kinda, yeah. it's like, I feel like I'm learning a language, man. There's so much to learn. There's so much that I don't know. And then talking about kind of the, the, the contention or the arguments or whatever discussions around exit order, especially in the loading area. Um, I, I don't want, and, and I know this is not what you guys are saying. That's why I'm clarifying. I don't want people to hear this like, Oh, don't argue. Don't be contentious. Just let the just let the organizers, the leaders of the angle jumps, just let them decide. That's not always the best because a lot of a lot of the LOs leaders don't know what they don't know. They're not trying to be bad. They just don't know. So because this has happened to me a few times, Tex, um, in the loading area, you know, some of the we've got a lot of belly groups, uh, belly flyers at San Marcos, and they're really great guys. Like very nice genuine I, i've tried to build relationships and we jump together sometimes and i really like them they like me and so <clears throat> sometimes in the loading area 
they're almost just out of kindness or, or something. They're just like, oh, Chris, you guys, I trust you. You guys do whatever. I'm not worried about you, Chris. You guys go ahead. And while that makes me feel nice for someone to say that to me, what I would rather, sometimes I want to be like, well, no, hold on. Help me think this through. Like, ho hold on just like, just help me think about this to make sure that we're doing it the right way. And when we stop to think, to try to think it through, if you come up to a question that you can't answer, that's good. That means Absolutely. you've identified something now that you don't know, you can go find the answer. So like sometimes that's what we got to do. Part of it, you know, the question like, how do we educate people more? Well, part of it's on us. Like you got to educate yourself. That, that is a piece of it, is try to answer these questions, try to talk through these things and think it through. And when you get to a wall that you can't figure it out or you can't think it through, awesome. Now you know what you need to try to learn and then go to the next wall, go to the next thing. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I feel like uh, I, I discuss this with my students in terms of their, when I'm doing more of the body flight coaching and the, the leadership, but I, I'm constantly, you know, reminding people that, uh, you know, their flying DNA, just because you've gotten away with it a bunch, doesn't mean that it's, <laughs> it's right. You know, so it's uh, we're, we're only we're only building things in through this like very methodical analysis of different situations and techniques we're using. And in terms of, uh, you know, your role as a leader, you know, your your part, part of your responsibility, one of those things on that giant list we would come up with is how we talk to other groups. So, you know, if there is an argument or in that case that you're using where people are just kind of deferring to you to be the one, the decision maker, you know, we can really reframe that discussion. We can turn those arguments into opportunities to provide more education or openly have, you know, our reasoning questioned so that we can provide a very well thought out answer or not, or we can consider the things that they're saying that we don't maybe have answers for at that time. And then start to think to ourselves, that's something that I, I should have an answer for. Um, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying it, but you know, I've worked uh, a few boogies over the past few years with Sandy Grillet, uh, the you know big belly uh, organizer, and I mean, you know, he's had a lot of run-ins with people opening in the middle of his group. So he just absolutely, when I started working with him, did not want to let me ever exit before him, which I understood. You know, it's it's got to not feel nice when you've been jumping for thirty or forty years and no one's ever come raining through your group. And then all of a sudden people start doing this cool new thing called angle flying and you've got people opening in the middle of your group all the time. Yeah. I don't blame them for being pissed off, you know, but the, the points that I always made to him was like, well, you know, you can, uh, you can be all of a sudden uh, opening and be falling through my group or I could be falling through you. So that doesn't change anything. So we actually have to come up with a, a better reasoning for, for how we're going to do this safely together. And one of the things that I really enjoyed working with people like him is creating that trust. I have good answers for those questions, hopefully. And then on top of that, I have a bit of flexibility uh, most of the time in most uh, situations to build in trust. Hey, I'm going to open in that spot. And when you see me open in that spot all day, you know, we have a discussion at the end of the day and I can tell you how we get there and how much ground we're covering and, and what we're exactly we're doing on the jump and why it would actually make sense, you know, and, and help the, uh, the canopy traffic and things like that. If maybe we went first instead of, uh, instead of, uh, after you or vice versa, and we can have those sort of discussions. But I do think that we don't want to get into a place where these rules are inhibiting our ability to think, uh, about this at a higher level. And I just got one quick example. I was just working, a event um, pretty recently in, uh, in Central America, and there's a really, really uh, highly uh, experienced belly organizer there, and they had a big way, and they just assumed that I was going to be going first. And I mean, it would not have even dawned on me to, to go before this 16 way, you know, with my four way angle flying group. But because of the drop zone they came from, and it's been enough years now, it wasn't even really part of the thought process to analyze the exit order was just assume that the tracking group was going to go before them. And while sure, we probably could have pulled it off and I probably could have made it safe in some way. It certainly is not the 
certainly not the right thing to do. Certainly not the the the, the way we're going to have the least amount of chance of, of any incident happening. Um, but it just dawned on me of wow, okay, we've now reached a point where, you know, the angle flyers are just being assumed to do a certain thing, or these discussions aren't happening because the rules themselves have kind of cut off our thinking of these sort of uh, exit order considerations. So I think it's something to, to definitely continue that conversation. And if they're contentious sometimes, great. It's, a, it's an excellent opportunity because those people are going to be very happy to let you, you know, hear what they think about it. And uh, when you come back with some pretty good answers, it's a lot of times it changes uh, and reframes that discussion quite quickly. Man, I, I just want to just want to add to the tail end of that, that it, it's going to be a tough balance. And I'm sure Tex is going to experience this as you move forward with with educating DZs. It's just such a tough balance between what's easy of making a rule and 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 going with that because it covers hopefully this wide variety of circumstances um, and balancing that with critical thinking of of understanding the the complexities of these jumps and and uh, not, not sadly we, we need some sort of certification process in the community so that so that there is a, a comfort level because we can't you can't always have personal interactions with with everyone, right? And, and you said, oh, oh, this leader said, oh, man, Chris, you go ahead. I'm not worried about you. But we don't always have that opportunity. We can't always, it's not always somebody we know. It's it, it. Maybe you only come out to the DZ once a month, but you still want to feel comfortable that you're going to have a safe skydive and this guy's going to stay out, you know, stay where he's supposed to be. So it's going to be a really interesting balance as we move forward of like trying to implement the things that we need for educational purposes and, and to keep the the jump safe, but also not just standing on those things as, well, we can just check out now and not even talk about it and just send the angle guys first because we have these rules. It, it, it's it got to be some kind of, of, of acceptable balance between those things. So uh, even as much as I'm looking forward to, to hearing what, what Tex is talking about as far as putting this stuff to DZOs and, and giving them at least a template to work from, hopefully that, that will also, it won't stifle critical thinking, basically. That's, that's, I want to, not do that i want people to still be thinking about okay what are we doing and why and it and it not it won't be a hundred percent of jumps we're going to show up to the loading area and we're going to look at the board and see what jump run is and and somebody's going to look at winds aloft or mark schultz and, and and we're just going to chat and see hey what makes the most sense like because as as tech said these groups can go anywhere and and it doesn't always mean first or last or first and second. It's just whatever the safest thing, whatever puts the most people in a good position. What are the canopy sizes in that angle group? What are the canopy sizes in the belly group? And there's just so many details that that you can't you can't say hard and fast rules. And even after saying that, we need some rules to 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 help it be safe. So I'm 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 really very optimistic to to hear that that's something that's being worked on. And I I look forward to uh, to seeing a uh, uh, maybe a beta version. <laughs> if, if I could just throw in one thing, one of the big things, Chris, is uh, creating a, an arena for having those sort of conversations. So uh, one of the things that, that Spaceland has done so well uh, here in Houston and Dallas, and I, I'm, I'm not sure if they've rolled it out in San Marcos just yet, Chris, uh, but that is uh, there's a board where leaders are actually required to, to draw out their flight paths uh, prior to the jump. And it's it's visible to everyone on the skydive. And what I've noticed over the past, uh, you know, half a year now that we've been using that board is that it obviously draws a lot of attention to the board and not just with the movement groups. But now you've got the, you know, the belly groups that want to come over and check it out and see where they expect to, to see us flying back from under canopy. Right. Uh, the, the vertical groups want to know where we're flying to so that they can see what, you know, where we're going to meet up in the, uh, the, the, the pattern, things like that. And it creates a, an environment and an arena really near that board for these sort of discussions to start to happen. Because it's more than just saying, I want to fly over here. It's like, well, okay, let's see who else is on the load. Because, you know, jump run is, is we're getting out super short here. Maybe maybe it's going to be better if we go here. Hey, belly guys, how big's your group? You know, and then we're having these conversations out loud with each other. And then as a uh, a harder thing to do that long-term culture project that uh, you know I, I care so much about though is is this 
Well, for Spaceland, it's not it's not uncommon to have a guy with 26 jumps walk up to me or anyone else at the drop zone and ask me, hey, what are you doing on this? And, you know, ask where they're supposed to go in the order or ask, or ask what did they think about this? And this is somebody with just a few jumps already coming up and, and feeling comfortable asking these questions and not just assuming that, oh, I'm, I'm this, so I, I go here. And they're going to learn early on, okay, you're a solo belly, great, but you're pulling at, you want to pull at five grants. So you're going to actually go in a different place in the order and they're going to get explained to that early on. So um, creating an environment where you're having those sort of conversations and then ideally a location, uh, you know, in the loading area where these conversations are happening in front of everyone. Um, and it's really good, especially those bigger drop zones where there's multiple moving groups because you're going to have multiple leaders. And uh, I think it helps kind of disseminate a little bit of this knowledge over time when these leaders are no longer having these conversations, you know, off to the side, but they're having them out in front of everybody of why their group's going to go before the other group, why they're going to either share the same side of jump run, or they're going to go opposite directions today. Or, and, and these things are being discussed openly. And, you know, you'd be surprised. I think there's a lot of those, the belly and, and vertical guys that don't have much interest in angle flying, but probably know a good deal about it uh, over the past year or so from being uh, involved in those conversations. Uh, man, that sounds like a, we, we don't have a board like that. We, you know, we have to write down our flight plan, plan on a, on a sheet of paper. And that goes to one of the grounds guys that's, you know, loading and then to the pilot. And, you know, we're supposed to check with every, any other movement groups on the, on the load and talk to the rest of the load and see what everybody's doing. But having a board and is it just a whiteboard and you wipe it clean after every jump? I mean, oh no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a giant map. It's a giant I mean, map. But I'm saying, is it you? Oh the yeah, map it's got a dry is a white. Yeah, it's a dry like erase, that. so you can just clean yeah. it off for the it's next. It's the same. Load. It's the same as your piece of paper. It's a, yeah. It's just a, we took that piece of paper and, and made a dry erase. Uh, took took it and ran. Yeah, and uh, made it into something that huh. is really visible to uh, the entire load. Which was is to me that's the biggest factor. Is is you know people can still go up there and draw squiggly lines, but the problem is if you're going to go up there and draw a squiggly line, well, you're going to be under a lot more scrutiny. scrutiny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People, people are going to have a question of what, what the hell is this, right? Yeah. Like, are you actually flying there, you know? Um, and I, I think, again, it goes to Jay Russ's point about, you know, there needs to be these some sort of barrier to leading and, and having these proof leader type of list. And that board, for instance, instead of having it on a piece of paper that you hand into a loader and no one really looks at, uh, which I think is already a step up from 99% of drop zones yeah. I go to. And yeah, it's already a step up from nothing. But when it all of a sudden becomes public, Visi it's visible see, yeah. as it should, it it creates that feeling of accountability becomes a lot more real, hmm. becomes a lot more real because you, you may have to answer questions for why you're choosing to fly that way and that direction and open there on this particular day before that group. And those there's no getting around those conversations if it's up for everyone to uh, to take a look at and interpret. Yeah, man, I like that. I, I we're, too. we're changing to that system as soon as I can get it done. Uh, I like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's awesome. Cool. Well, uh, any, anything else that we need to, that we need to mention or bring up or anything else? Want to go mind? for two more hours? <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me. <laughs> this no, I mean, it's great. It, yeah. It's, it just, there's so many things to touch on. It's been great to hear from, from text in my opinion. It's, it's just so much experience doing this stuff and so much time thinking about the way to do it right so i mean it's awesome yeah well you've done it again you've you i'm not gonna say i'm not gonna say wasted you've burned up another perfectly good hour listening to j russ tex and chris uh here at the, the crave show so and guys thank you so much I, I, this is really really beneficial I, I know that it's a big help for me and for everybody listening i hope a lot of people get to hear this and and benefit from it and it's going to make us all safer, um, really. So, Tex, thanks for being a part, man, for making the effort to, to be with us. It's really good. Yeah, man. Thank you. I, I appreciate you all having me on. And, you know, um, hope hope it didn't seem like we got too off track with, uh, you know, we originally came on to talk about exit order. But I think uh, I think exit order just opens the door for these sort of conversations. It's such an interesting topic. And uh, when you get into the nuance of it, then you can go into all the reasons behind it. And it's a, it's a really great starting point for 
these sort of discussions and uh, the direction of kind of modern skydiving. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not off topic. It, it's it's at the root of the topic is what I'm yeah. is what I think. I agree. You know, that's what we're doing is helping everyone. You know, it's like a, a good teacher doesn't just teach the students what they need to know. They they teach the student how to be a good learner how to be a good student. That's, that's what a, the, the best teachers help others become good students. And that's, I, I think that's what, you know, you guys are, are helping us do is helping us see that, okay, we need to try to think these things through for ourselves and ask questions, talk, criticize, analyze all that stuff. And that we can all help figure this out so we can all be safer and have more fun and, and, and enjoy the sky. You know, I mean, that's what we're doing. We're enjoying the sky. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks guys. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. If you're listening out there, reach out to us, send us a message, get in contact, ask us some questions or, or whatever, but, uh, have fun in the sky. Enjoy jumping out of airplanes and playing with your friends. Crave do more, be better. Thanks you guys. Blue skies. Thanks guys. Thanks guys.